today I'm going to be talking about the power of your story. And the way that I'm going to be doing that is really to focus a little bit about my story, as well as to talk about what it means to come out in the LGBT community, to come out beyond that. Um, so that's some of the experiences that I'm going to be sharing today. And one of the key pieces that I want to highlight about that is that when you're talking about just the power, again, of our stories, it's rare that we really think about that, the impact that each of us have just by telling our own personal narratives to another person. Um, it's something that I rarely thought about until I got into this field. Um, we just forget about that. You know, we're taught about the power of fictional narratives. You know, we all have great stories that have touched our lives, but we forget about that personal piece and about that one-on-one -on -one connection that we make with people just by telling our own stories. One way that you can really see this and um, some of the research that's shown this is really through um, the LGBT community when you're talking about the movement for marriage equality. And now I'm, whether, no matter where you stand on that issue, I think it's really important to kind of take a look at the research that's taken place and, and again, to be able to see that impact in this really powerful way. So what we've realized as a community when we're talking about the movement for marriage equality is that in the beginning, people were really focusing that on talking about human rights, well, to human rights. And that was really going nowhere. And it, what we've seen is that it was that one-on-one -on -one sharing of personal narratives. It was that sharing of, this is the impact that this is really having on me. This is my family. This is who I am. And I really want you to understand that and see that. And then it's a way to create that mutual respect, to understand another person, and understand that connection of shared humanity that we all have, and many times we forget about when things become very politicized, and particularly when we're talking about our own personal identities. I don't know about other people in the room, but for me, um, one of the backgrounds that I come through is through um, women's studies and through um, feminist theory, and one of the things that we've learned through that is the idea of the personal being political. And it's very important to understand exactly what that means, that it's very difficult to separate our personal identities from what is being politicized out there. And so that you can imagine the impact on that when you're talking about who you are and what that means to you and having that become something that becomes more of a political narrative. And so I think it's important for us to understand, again, the impact of our own personal narrative um, and being able to share that and while I, I'm sharing this about LGBT people and our identities, I think that the important piece is to be able to understand that each and every one of you in this room have your own personal narratives that are very powerful and that we should all um, be able to share that. And again, it's a way to, to share that personal connection and that shared humanity. All right, so I'm going to start by sharing a little bit about me and who I am. I did grow up in Texas, born and raised. I um, Grew up in a little town outside of Dallas called Waxahachie. And it was while I was in high school that I realized that I was different. And I didn't really know how to put words to that and what that meant. Um, for me personally, I knew that gay men existed, um, but I didn't really understand any of the other labels. And as we were talking about kind of technology and smartphones and such, I, I think it's important to understand that I come from a very specific time when I was coming out, so I didn't have the opportunity to Google things on the internet or look things up on my smartphone. Um, it was really just about being able to, if you can, and if you feel comfortable, go into a library or seeking out somebody that might have a shared identity. Um, so for me, in high school, I really didn't have the ability to do that, um, not without having some fear for my safety or, or being outed. So I didn't know exactly how to label it. I just knew that I was different from my friends. And also, you know, coming out in high school, I, I didn't, at that point, I, it was really about coming out to myself and understanding what that meant to me personally. I wasn't ready to share that, because again, I didn't really know what that meant. Um, and it wasn't really until my senior year of high school that I started to realize that this was something that I couldn't continually push back into the backgrounds that I really needed to own and understand um, one night when I was watching the Grammys my senior year. And I called my best friend and I was like, oh my gosh, did you see this guy on right now? He's so cute. And she was like, um, Sydney, that's Katie Lang. 
And I know for many of you in the audience, again, use your smartphones to Google it, but if you, do, <laughs> if you don't know who Katie Ling is, once you Google, you'll understand. So at that point, it was a light bulb moment for me that, all right, this is something that um, I need to get, wrap my head around and understand more just for my own personal identity development. So after that, I moved on to the college years. And this is really, and I think a lot of people in the room will understand this, this is really where I came into who I was on a multitude of levels and, um, and various identities. But for me, I went to a two-year women's college in Missouri called Cotty College. And I think for some of you in the room, there's a big stereotype out there about women's colleges um, that, of course, that there are a lot of LGBT people at um, women's colleges. And the thing that people don't really understand is that because that stereotype has existed for so long, that it's not always the easiest place to, to be out or to come out um, because there's a lot of pressure to try to move away from that stereotype and not play into that. So for me, that was a very interesting time, um, but luckily I was able to connect with some other people that also had similar identities, and so it helped me to understand my own identity, and at that point I started to come out to myself um, in a variety of ways. And then when I transferred to Texas Women's University, um, again, another when I transferred there, it's actually co-ed now, and it was co-ed then, um, but we still didn't have the same resources it was a different time, um, and we didn't have the, the centers like we have here at Texas A&M University. So for me, at the, luckily, I was able to find a support group through the student organization, as well as a, a discussion and support group that um, the counseling department had put on. And so I was able to kind of explore my own identity in more direct ways and really find um, a community to, to help support me, and that was great. Um, but as we move on and to my master's program, so I love this picture because this is really capturing a moment in time for me, um, but very interesting. I went on to Minnesota State, Mankato, um, for my master's. And one of the things is that in order to afford to go out of state, I really needed to have a graduate assistantship. And I found myself at 23 years old, having been out for just a few years, um, in charge of an LGBT center on a campus. At that time, even though Mankato was the, has, has the second oldest center in the nation, um, it was just run by one GA, and that was me. So very interesting to, again, having just come out to myself and to others, and find myself in charge of the center. And even at that point, I wasn't completely out because it wasn't out to my mom. Um, so that was very interesting. But the piece that I think I want to highlight about this is that when I became a coordinator for that center, that's when I realized that being in charge of a center, working with the LGBT community in the way that I did, it's that in many, many ways you become a keeper of stories. I cannot tell you how many coming out stories, how many personal narratives that I've heard from people, both LGBT identified and people that were impacted by others, maybe family members or close friends that have come out. Um, and so one of the things that I end up doing is having all of these one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and, and faculty and staff and community members about their identities and hearing their stories. And it's very powerful. For some people, it's just about that sharing of the story. I need to share my story. I need somebody else to hear me. For other people, it may be that they need some resources, that they need some help, they need um, some guidance, whatever the case may be. Um, but that is where I really started to understand not only the impact of my own personal story, but what it means for others. That's also around the time, again, this is going to date myself, but right when I was, that first year when I was in charge of the center is also when the tragic murder of Matthew Shepard happened. And I know for many people in the room, you may have been one or two or toddlers at that point, um, but this was a hugely impactful piece. And I want to highlight this not only because having been in charge of the center at that point um, and having a, a tragic event like this, and it was the first one that really made a huge national impact, um, it, it thrust many of the centers and communities into the national spotlight. So for me, this was the first time that I had actually been interviewed by a television crew, by radio stations and such. And one of the pieces that was really driven home to me by this is how 
somebody's personal story, something that impacted somebody, has become an, a story for a community. Um, and just how that made a huge difference and impacted so many people's lives, hearing the tragic, tragic nature of um, his unfortunate murder. Now, a little bit more about identity and about the understanding of personal narratives. So when I came out originally to my father, who was the first family member that I came out to, I remember this very, very distinctly. Um, and my dad has always been very supportive of me. But as I was coming out, you know, I said, Dad, I really need to talk to you. And we were, we were in a car, <laughs> which is interesting because I have a lot of students tell me now, like, I, I, I'm going to come out, but I'm going to wait until we're in a car because, they, you know, we're, we're stuck. <laughs> we're confined in that space. It's not always the greatest idea either. You know, you never know how that's going to go. But for me, you know, we were in the car. I wanted to have, you know, we had this one-on-one -on -one time, and I wanted to, to be able to have this conversation with him. So my dad, I'm bisexual. And I remember very distinctly my dad's response to this day. He said, well, I can understand if you said that you were gay or lesbian, but I really don't understand this bisexual thing. And that really put firmly implanted an idea for me that there's something wrong with my identity, that people don't understand, that it's not a valid identity. And so I continually was hearing that message, both from people within the community and outside of the community. Um, and I just list here, I, I also use the labels um, pansexual and queer to you that just depends on how I'm feeling. But really um, understanding that, that message of how people can have an impact on your personal narrative too and your story and sometimes prevent you from really holding on to that, really, being, really celebrating that. Um, and so that, that was a moment for me. And once I got to Mankato and I found myself in charge of a center, I was hearing that message more um, from other students. And so I started to internalize that. And something that we refer to as um, internalized biphobia, Michelle also internalized transphobia, internalized homophobia. The way that we take those messages that are coming from us externally and we internalize those. And it affects us. And it affects the way that, that we put ourselves out there. It impacts how we think about ourselves it can really have some huge consequences on our lives. So for me, my own personal identity journey, I share this because I think it's really important to understand how sharing stories can sometimes, and putting yourself out there, can also have a huge impact on you in both positive and negative ways. One of the things that helped to change that for me is that through working again in the community, I'm able to have a lot of connections with people on a broad national scale. And Robin Oaks is a speaker, um, a writer, an educator, an activist, and uh, who also identifies as bisexual. And she came to speak for the first time um, at one of the institutions that I, I brought her in, one of the institutions I worked at before here. And through her coming to campus, I really was able to, to own my identity in ways that I hadn't before. And again, I've been working with community for many years, but the impact and the power of having that, that narrative challenged by many people had caused me to not be as out and open about all of my identities as I should have been or would have liked to have been. Now, I share that, too, to understand that I've brought Robin to many campuses, along with other speakers as well, about a variety of identities. I just like to use her as an example because it was also a personal moment for me. But I can't tell you how many students have come to me after hearing Robin or, again, any other speakers talking about their own personal identities and talking about the impact that they had, that it had for them, and being able to claim who they were, and being able to share that for the first time. Um, and hearing somebody else say, yes, I identify in this way, or this is, this is how I am, and this is who I am, and being able to, to have, again, that shared humanity, and being able to, to, to really claim their identity for the first time, and to have somebody else help to make that valid. It's unfortunate that we need that, but for many of us, we do need that. We need to know that we're not alone. So again, the power of the personal narrative. I shared some of those pieces, but I also want to, to go into a little bit more depth really quickly about that power again. I talked about me being the keeper of stories, and I do not take that lightly at all. I cannot tell you the impact that that has had on me, but also other people to know that there's somebody who can listen, that really hears you and really understands who you are and what that means to you. That's such a huge piece, particularly on our campus with our students. Um, 
here are some of the things that I get approached with from students talking about their own personal narrative. Um, a lot of it is about coming out or being outed. We still have students on our campus that, for whatever reason, end up being outed to family. A lot of times it has to do with people finding out information on social media um, and actually being disowned from their families. So that is something that still happens to this day, being cut off financially. I deal with a lot of students who really don't know how am I going to be able to finish my academic career. Um, and, and then the sharing of stories. I also have been very lucky from the beginning of my career in LGBT services to work with students on how to tell their story and share that with the world. I cannot tell you the impact that it has had um, throughout the campus, but both on this campus and other campuses that I've worked at. That piece about sharing your story, about going into the classroom, having a space or student organization, and having a space to really be able to talk about your own identity or identities and what that means to you and what that looks like. And having a safe space for people to also ask questions about what does that mean what does that look like? How has that impacted your life? And to have that mutual understanding, um, to create that mutual respect. It's not always about, like I would love it if everybody you know, out, proudly identified as an LGBT ally, but that's not what it's always about. Sometimes it's just about creating that mutual respect and understanding, about having a space to say, you know what? We have that shared humanity and knowing that. I also want to point out um, that I was lucky enough to be a namesake this past year for Fish Camp. But one of the things that we've been able to do through Fish Camp, too, is sharing that personal narrative as well. So one of the reasons why I'm standing here today is through um, my campfire speech at, at Fish Camp and being able to share my personal story and just how many people that had a huge impact on who had been concerned about being here, about being LGBT, or having family members and such that identify as LGBT, and who have come up to me since and have told me the impact that just me sharing my personal story had on them to help them feel more connected to the institution and like they were going to have support for who they are or who their close family or friends were. We also have a video that we show at Fish Camp um, every year that also has that impact, and I can't tell you how many incoming freshmen that I see that say, you know what, I felt like I had made the right choice once I saw that video. So again, it's that piece about sharing our personal narrative, about sharing who we are with one another, to create that shared humanity and that connection and opening up hearts and minds so that we would have a better understanding of one another. So I'll end with this quote, which is one of my favorites. People become the stories they hear and the stories they tell. That is really what